and 62. That's great. So I enjoy gaming, but in my free time, I also do photography. You are listening See, to he has free times. a podcast brought to you by the Shut Up and Respawn Network. Welcome, everybody, to episode 162 of the Freelancer Codex podcast. If I get really close to the microphone and talk like this, it sounds like we could be on the radio. Mike. Did you say 62 or 52? We are on. I have to go back and listen to that again. I think you said 52 because we are at 62. 162 times we have gotten together to discuss things going on in our life, video games, media, world events. We've talked about sports. We've talked about gaming. We've talked about sports gaming. We've talked about kids getting bigger, things changing, things getting different. We have been with you for, we could probably do the math. So 162 episodes at roughly an hour and a half per episode. That's that's 200. That's 203 hours worth of content. Some more. Um Man, we've been with you. We've been with you all for a long time, and you've been with us for that long. Six hundred and seven hours. No, that's wrong. That is wrong. Ninety <laughs> times one hundred and sixty-two, fourteen thousand five hundred eighty divided by. Um. So that's how many episodes 60? divided by. Shut it. Why would I divide it by sixty? Two hundred and forty-three hours. 243 hours you've been with us we've been with you we've i don't think that math it. makes sense either it does it does it it doesn't but it's okay you're just math i don't is, i don't have the time i don't have the time to <laughs> so figure we do want to thank out. everybody who's been with us for this long we especially want to thank our patrons julius nathan b michael r trent b mana still man and still mana and still scout 69 dragonheart 76 nice. jeffrey h Gameplay experience, RZ and Phaedrin. We appreciate y'all being Patreons. Patreons. Almost almost added, almost turns you into a football team. We appreciate you being patrons. Um, if you want to sign up to be a patron, check out patreon.com slash freelancer codec. What I what I say. Doesn't See, matter. you correct me every time I say it, and, and I have a complex now. So you can never say Patreon because you're a patron on Patreon. And that Whatever. gets very confusing. I'm a pa- I'm a Patriot fan, except when I'm not, which is all the time. I don't know. We also understand if you're no longer listening to the show, because you know what? I get it. I get it. I do. So, Mike, hey, man, how are you? What's going on over there? I'm doing well. What have I'm you been well. up to this I'm, week? I'm starting to feel a little bit of allergy season, I think. I've got an itchy eye, which happens right around this time for me. Allergies are a crazy thing. Our seasons are changing. It's getting warmer here in the Land of Enchantment and Four Corners area. We were up to 60 degrees today, and it gets starts to dry out up here. And that's when my allergies start to mess with my face, and I don't like it when they mess with my face because they hurt, and I end up having to take time off of work. Um, And, yeah, that's about it going on with – I had a thought, but then I lost my thought. I don't know where it went. Um, you were How gonna, are you doing, Steve? I'm good. You are going to tell me what you were up to this week um, with everything that you're doing, drinking your Dunder Mifflin cup. Um, have you finally downloaded Myst on the Oculus Quest 2? I did. So so jumping right into it, um, my oldest brother, our oldest brother, convinced me to get Myst. And I'm like, okay, I'll try out Myst. Wait, try before you the... continue the story, I've been telling you to get this game for a long time. So why are you listening to your oldest brother and not listening to me? So He like, gave me birthday money. Whatever. <laughs> well, he did. He did. <laughs> you're, ruining, you're ruining my story. All right. Um, I actually, I don't recall you pushing me towards Myst. Um, there's only like several episodes of the show we can put into evidence. We can probably check. Anyway, yeah. I picked up Mist, started it for the Oculus 2, and and I thought this is kind of cool, neat environment. Um, okay, let's let's jump it in, let's do these puzzles. And then I was like, how do you do these puzzles? I'm like, I'm usually pretty good at puzzles and 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 then I'm like, why did I get this game? There's so many puzzles. Um, How many puzzles did you think would be in the game? 
I didn't think every movement required a puzzle. The whole game is right? a puzzle. Exactly. Exactly. So I do I do have to confess that for the first the first little jump start, um, I had to I had to read a guide online to to kind of understand and, and I don't know if I'm saying this the right way, but the understand the um the the what the game is of the puzzles oh. maybe what the game is and like and like how to read and understand the puzzles because because at first glance they're not super intuitive um because they're puzzles right so they're so you're supposed to go in and for me there's almost too much reading oh i hate reading um and there are a few times that i got stuck that had and i had to kind of like really try hard and get and I'm and I'm only good for about an hour on the Oculus at a time, and so that kind of stymies me a little bit. But but other than that, it's fun. I'm enjoying it. Mist is fun. Um, it's it's very uh, much an alone type of game. You're very much in the environment by yourself, and so um, you know take that for what it is. So it's fun though. I enjoy it, and I'm thankful that that Steve was able to point me in that direction because mist is a great addition to uh the oculus so i think mist is one of the pillars of pc gaming and also i think you're right because like i i really want to play it eventually if it ever comes to steam i will also pick it up so i can play it here um i have memories of the first one playing through it and doing those puzzles but when you take it from like okay mist used to be just point and click so when you are trying to figure out a puzzle it's much easier and quicker with a mouse on a flat screen to be able to trial and error. But I imagine that if you are in VR and you're like right there staring at this big puzzle, there's probably a lot more moving around, move this piece over yep. here, see what it does. So it's not as quick as me just moving my mouse and like, oh, can I click but, on this? But not only that, it's also see what you did, move back to get the bigger picture, move forward. And it's always tricky to get kind of like where you're standing in the right spot when you put yourself in the right spot. Maybe you're too close. Maybe you're too far back. Maybe you can't reach all the way. Yeah. And then always dealing with um, with the virtual boundaries. One of the cool things, and this is a, a nice segue. Um, so one of the cool things that Oculus has added within the last week since our last show, because Oculus has two options. They have a seated boundary ability and then a room scale boundary ability. Um, the room scale, you can you can map out your living room, den, wherever you do your gaming. Um, but most of the times before you do that, you have to clear the area first. Chairs, beanbags, pets, all kinds of stuff. So you define that area, and once you get close to the area, it lets you know you're getting too close. It's actually a really neat feature. Um, and, I, and I think when you experienced it for the first time, you were like, wow, this is really, really cool. And I thought the same thing. Anyway, this past week, they came out with an update where you can actually now add a couch into your room scale. It's, and it's your actual couch. You map it, and it turns into a couch in your virtual environment. So you can jet, you can walk around, and then you can sit on this couch that you put. It does give you a prompt and says, ask you if you want to switch to your stationary boundary. You click yes, and then you're already in your stationary boundary versus switching the Guardian in your settings. So it's actually a really neat feature. I look forward to when you're able to map your whole house. Um, I think that can come next. I've tried mapping. We have two big areas in the house that kind of uh, meet together at one point. And I've tried mapping those two areas, but I think when the Guardian gets too big, it starts to suck up a bunch of uh, processing power. And so it kind of starts to lag and kind of rubber bands and stuff and glitches out on you. Um, but I think that would be a really neat, the, the next, it seems like the next logical thing for me is that you can map to your whole house because then you can just walk around in virtual, virtual reality your whole life. You don't even have to talk to your family. You have to talk to people. You can walk around objects and you just live in your own world, right? Are there, because as you're saying that, I'm thinking like if you had multiple people, if you mapped out your house and you had multiple people in Oculuses at the same time. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Could, could because we the then... cool thing about the Oculus, the thing about the Oculus, Steve, is that it has four cameras looking to the outside, right? That's how the Guardian works. That's how it knows where you are. 
that's how the NSA knows where you are, right? Because because the Oculus is put out by Facebook. Obviously, they're just grabbing all the data coming from my house. Like they know where my couch is now, which is which is one of the the things that I think about this VR headset that I bought. That I'm like, oh, I, I kind of didn't look at the fine print, the implied fine print that's there, because because they're seeing everything that I'm doing, right? Because that's what they can do, and it's got cameras on it. So yeah, put everything your I see, they on, see. So. Do what? Put your pants back on when you're using it, just in case. Put my pants back on, and even I might need to to blot out the cameras because. And I say that I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but also I say that because recently, as part of the what I've been doing, I watched the movie Snowden, with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and and the stuff that 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 came from that movie, how NSA was like turning on webcams and and that kind of you know. Um, at home citizen surveillance kind of thing. So it just got me to thinking now I put this device on my head that has cameras on it that that is now tracking my house, right? So like I wonder what information they do have. And the government and, is and sending they, 5G through and your And did brain. they not exactly and did they not have that information anyway because I have an Apple phone in my pocket, right? That is listening and recording everything it sees and does and hears. So yeah. you know there's that great to be uh great to be where we are yeah but going back to the oculus thing multiplayer if you were to set that up had four people under oculus quests quests is and then those people are able <laughs> to see each other and then we just go full D D virtual reality multiple people the same room fighting a dragon that is like, what i want that it's it could be super cool right and it and there's no reason it doesn't seem like there's any reason why you shouldn't be able to do it um even even multiplayer beat saber um you could get multiple people in mist even yeah um that would oh, be pretty I cool so i did a i did a uh i think i may have talked about this earlier but i did a flight simulator yeah um that made me sick and made me want to throw up my guts because flight simulators yep but then thinking on that multiplayer like it would be cool to to like pilot the millennium falcon versus in multiplayer right you've got you've got multiple people there doing that just the oh, possibilities like are very thing. very intriguing to to have multiplayer vr with quests especially the quest talking to each other mapping where you are cuz that because we have the technology already it's there um, and hopefully something like that is being worked on well um, so we said super cool we said it out loud so i'm sure it already exists and someone's already doing it so but that, think. that is very cool. But speaking of you getting sick, I will go over something that I did this week, and then we'll jump into a couple of news topics and then into our main focus of WandaVision. So I downloaded the Outriders demo. I will preface this that these are my personal thoughts. These are my opinions. If you are enjoying the game, I'm glad for you. I'm excited for you. Continue to enjoy it. I had a pretty terrible experience with the Outriders demo. The... Physically, I had a reaction that I don't think I've ever had playing another game. And I've played, you know, I've gotten sick playing Star Wars Rogues, um, Star Wars Squadrons in VR. But Outriders does something really weird with their camera. I think their cutscenes, their frame rate drops to 30. So I think I was at a pretty high frame rate um, unlocked playing the normal game. And then anytime it drops into a cutscene, it drops the frames to 30 frames. And then it does something that I have no idea how this ever passed QA or how this was like okayed from the development studio. But it's shaky cam for every single cutscene. Even if you are just walking up to talk to someone, it's like someone is holding a cell phone, but this person like is like just uncontrollably shaking like they just can't hold still like they had 12 espressos and their heads are about to explode because of how much caffeine they have that might be a little mm -hmm. bit of an exaggeration but physically i had this weird reaction where i could not watch the cutscenes because it was making me sick because that's of, interesting and it's not like an aggressive like jason Bourne shake it's this really small slight shake that kind of like made me like i had this weird reaction that i could not like watch the game during any of the cutscenes because of this camera shake 
and it's really hard to like. Did you find it. yourself getting angry at it? Yeah. Were you like, like stop it? <laughs> yeah, I was very angry, and like normally, it's normally like I can deal with shaky cam. It's not a big deal, but because it happens in every like, even when you're just talking to the guy at the gun range, hey, I want to go shoot this thing. There's like this weird shaky cam thing going on. It's like I have no idea why this decision was made. Hopefully, it gets changed. I hate it, and it like really did like. Um, ruin my experience with the game all right so beyond that so going into the game you kind of get a very brief story like you're going to go down to this planet and i will i will also preface this that i have not looked into anything related to outriders like i haven't done any research on the game i haven't watched any trailers on the game i wanted to go in just play it my goal was to experience the story i wasn't going to go into outriders looking to grind loot that's just not something i am interested any longer i'm tired of these loot grinds i'm tired and this is not a live service game so this is you get in you get what you want and you get out so i was like hey i'm gonna go in i'm gonna experience the story and it'll be fine so and this is all in the demo so i don't feel bad spoiling this because it's available to everyone everywhere to play this but you are like someone that's going to go down and you're going to see if this planet is livable there's a couple ships that have been sent out into space to find this place where humanity can repopulate so you go down to this planet you have to find a couple beacons um you find a couple are the beacons be lit are the beacons of Midas Tirith so you find these beacons you light them and a couple things happen like the story is not very involved at all it is very surface surface level tropey the minute um one character go comes on screen you say oh that guy's the bad guy he's going to be a jerk Turns out he's a bad guy. He's going to be a jerk. He kind of ruins everything. When you say, hey, we can't land here. And he's like, we're going to land here because they told us to land here. And you're like, why are you dressed like an anime character from Final Fantasy? That was weird also. So then he ends up killing the guy that you came down with. And then you kill him. And then like all this stuff is going bad. And someone's like, oh, to save your life, I'm going to put you in this cryo tube. You get shoved in a cryo tube for 30 years and you wake up. And the first thing you see is someone graffitied F you close to your cryo tube. And then we go from like sci-fi exploration into like post-apocalyptic. There's a bunch of corpses hanging from rafters in this place. And I'm just like, oh, I didn't. I guess I didn't know what game I was playing because I, the tone shifted. Up for this. <laughs> yeah. If I would have known we sent the worst of humanity to this planet, maybe I would have gone on the other ship. But so like the tone shifts kind of there in the middle of the demo. And I played for a little bit longer. Um, immediately, I really just wanted to be able to jump. You can't jump in the game. And I don't know if this is just like I've got some Anthem PTSD of wanting <laughs> to jump into the air in a javelin and just like start flying around. Um but you're just like you're you're landlocked and there's cover mechanics and there's weapons that you can get and there's people you can farm for those weapons and i said to myself i'm just not interested so i uninstalled it and i know that there's a lot of people having fun with it i'm glad that they are so this is going to be one that i i'm glad they released the demo because i know that i don't need to purchase the game and i do not need to fill any type of fomo while other people are playing it because I think I got what I needed out of it and I'm no longer interested in finding out what the story has to hold. But that's just me personally. So if you, again, my personal opinions, I did not enjoy the Outriders demo and I will not be playing any more of it. So hmm. and there you go. That is my quick review of Outriders. All right, Mike, should we talk about some news? There is some news that we can talk about. Why don't we talk about some news? All right, I gotta talk to you about something. So Doom Three is a come is a coming. That's like a Mario. It's, it's a me. Coming. It's a coming. I will read this news <laughs> thing like Mario. It's a me, a Mario. So Doom Three is coming to VR. That's virtual reality officially. The Bloodspring Demon Slaying Classic Doom 3 is finally getting a VR release. The first person shooter from id Software will be coming to PlayStation VR on March 29th and will be playable on PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 through backward compatibility 
Doom 3 VR Edition will feature both the original game and its expansions. Resurrection of Evil and The Lost Mission. Michael, since you are into VR, even though you won't be able to play this because it's coming into um, PlayStation, and since you don't own a PlayStation, my question is this. What game would you want to see made into a VR game that is not already a VR title so that you could play? Um, so that's an interesting question because I've thought about this, and I have some, I have some differing... Um, um you're gonna get a lot here probably more than what you want you probably just want me to say a game and move on but i've thought about this quite a bit and so it's a little bit nuanced there is a game that i want to get for the family it is called disneyland adventures um surprise it's it's centered on disney i'm so surprised. um we yep we had this um on uh, xbox and we played it with connect and we've played it without connect with connect it's all right because you kind of get to move around and stuff um lots of lots of lean to the left lean to the right um move around kind of thing you get to run around disneyland park which is super fun for our family because we like doing that and it seems like i mean it would translate perfectly to vr um move around the park play some all the rides in the park turn into like mini games kind of thing and it's a collection type game where you collect badges when you do certain things that game would be fun i think the kiddos would like it a lot I would like to see um, more Star Wars. I'm definitely into the Star Wars games. Um, I would like to see those get bigger and larger and have those turn into more epic games versus I think what some just call experiences, which makes sense to me now. At first I was like, why is this called an experience and not a game? And I'm like, oh, because it's because it's an hour and a half long and I get it now, right? So I get it. I would like to see that universe get more expansive. I also want to find a really good FPS. I think I say that I haven't tried too many and I don't know how they would ultimately turn out, but I think it would be really cool to see. Um, I mean, if I, if I could choose any game to turn into VR, I would definitely choose destiny to turn into VR uh, just cause, just cause it, the Venn diagram, it crosses a bunch of my circles. Um, a Lord of the Rings VR game would I think be really cool because um, it has a lot of the same mechanics like a Star Wars game, right? So lots of swords. You have lots of handles that, you know, you have your your handle that you're moving around through the air a lot. Bows and so arrows that would be a really magic. fun game to have. Say that again. Bows and arrows and magic. Bows and arrows, magic, things that you can cast from either a seated or, or a room scale area. I think maybe even um, some of the Lego games would be fun um in vr because then you kind of get to move your you could move your hands around to actually build the things that you build in the lego world plus the lego world is fun it'd be it'd be fun to like when you lift up your hands you see your claws versus versus the hands so that would be fun to do um so yeah very cool and if you want you could play doom 3 on the playstation 4 or playstation 5 which i'm pretty sure you just said gloom Gloom 3, that's a different I game. Said, I think you said Gloom 3 just now. All right, Mike, you added this other news story here that so you I wanted to talk about. I did add this other news story. So this came out recently. Um, so we're getting ready to hit our spring break, and we are going to get out of the state for a little bit because we have to. We've been confined. So we're going to go somewhere. And uh, my wife told me, she said, we're going to get in the car and we're going to drive until we hit a beach. She says she doesn't care what beach we're going to go to. We're just going to drive until we get a beach. I said, okay, we're going to do that. Um, so we're going to head out to California. Um, and we thought, well, why don't we just check and see what's going on on the Disney properties while we're there. And this is what we found out. Currently, um, downtown Disney is open for dining and shopping. And parts of Disney's California Adventure are open for dining and shopping currently. And we thought that's going to be really cool. Um, we can at least check those places out when we go there. We're not going to make that like our, our, our intended reason to go there, but it'll be fun to go eat, um, walk around a store kind of thing. That's going to be really cool. And then we got word, this was probably on Sunday, we got word that, that um, Disney is going to offer an experience called a Touch of Disney. And we thought, this is going to be really cool. They're going to start opening stuff. 
And then as we read more into it to figure out what's going on, we found out that Disney's California Adventure is actually going to close on March 14th, only to be later reopened on March 18th for this Touch of Disney experience. So this Touch of Disney experience, um, it's a $75 ticket per person to get in. And what it includes is parking in the uh, Mickey parking structure, which currently I don't think is open, a $25 food voucher, and an unlimited photo pass usage because included in this Touch of Disney are going to be character experiences to be added to the dining and the shopping that is already open in Disney's California Adventure Park. And I didn't think much of it when I first heard it. We were kind of excited that it was going to be open. But then we started thinking to ourselves, this stuff is open as it stands already, right? So the shopping and the dining is open in California Adventure right now. The ticket is going to allow you better parking, a food voucher, and photo pass, which which, if you kind of weigh those options, you're like, okay, yeah, I get it. I can park closer. Um, I get some food with it. And then photo pass for the characters. But it seems odd to me that, that these experiences are open already, and now they're going to close them and then open, it again, open them again to charge for them. Um, so we don't know how to feel about that. There's a, li- there's a little bit of on the one hand and then on the other hand, but, but it seems kind of strange. And that's just odd. But that's all. Like I haven't come to any like definitive conclusion on how I feel about it yet. Cause I'm not sure how I feel. So this is a very open ended statement because it's not, um, very well defined yet. You know, In the days of a pandemic, when we're told to stop touching people, to keep our distance, why on earth would they name this a touch of Disney? It it does seem it does seem a little maybe maybe it's a little tongue in cheek. Maybe they're. I think it's a little tone deaf, is what it is. No, I mean yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. I could do this no, all night. No, it's not. Yes, it it's, is. It's funny. No, it's, it's funny. It's not funny. It is. It no, is. And you're not. and you're wrong on your idea of this whole thing. So um, no, it's okay. So yeah. So there's that. But anyway, that's what's opening up um, in Southern California. If you are listening from Southern California, and you did not know that before, that is happening. Tickets actually go on sale March fourth for that. Um, and so I'll be staying up way past the show to see if we can get tickets. I don't know. Michael we'll see, they, loves Disney. Yeah. All right, cool. So yeah, so I have to wake up. All right, yes, you have to wake up. That's good to wake up. All right, I'm going to talk about one more thing before we go into our big news thing for WandaVision. And this comes from Nintendo. We don't talk about Nintendo a lot on this show, but now that Devin's gone, we can... Uh, um, Talk about it all yeah, we want. We can talk about it all we want. All right. So this comes from Nintendo.com. Action meets RPG as the Pokemon series reaches a new frontier. I, in the past, this is not part of the news thing. This is just me cutting in. I, in the past, have criticized um, Poke- um, Nintendo and Game Freak for not really moving outside of their comfort zone in the Pokemon franchise. So this is kind of a breath of fa- fresh air. Get ready for a new kind of grand Pokemon adventure in Pokemon Legends Arceus. Arceus, 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 whatever, however you say that. It's a brand new game from Game Freak that blends action and exploration with RPG roots of the Pokemon series. Explore natural expanses to catch Pokemon by learning their behavior, sneaking up, and throwing a well-aimed Pokeball. You sound like Robin Leach talking on the lifestyles of the rich and famous. You can also (laughs) toss the Pokeball containing your ally Pokemon near a wild Pokemon to seamlessly enter battle. The new angle on Pokemon gameplay will deliver an immersive personal experience brought to life by both Pokemon and humans. So we are getting a first, our first third person perspective looks kind of, our first third person perspective in Pokemon. (laughs) Well, I guess the other games have been, they've been top down. All right. So this is the first time Pokemon is kind of reaching out of their, hey, this is how the game is played from the Game Boy. We've got 
updates to isometric views in 3ds and now we're finally going into a behind the character running around open world pokemon in the open world that you can sneak up on catch throw pokeballs at battle side by side with your pokemon with your trainer i think this is pretty cool i'm glad to finally see that pokemon and game freak are branching out trying something new finally doing something a little bit different um i don't think the game looks like super amazing graphically i don't think it needs to i think it just needs to start innovating on what it actually is in order to get people like myself who have not bought a switch to actually consider buying one so that i can get in on this pokemon action because i probably will now because i think this looks really interesting this comes out sometime next year and this happens in the Sinnoh region of pokemon i think it's they're based on japan and there's a bunch of pokemon that are going to be in this i imagine that there will be pokemon in this pokemon game um so yeah <laughs> i'm excited for that and we'll have to wait for more news on that later on in the future and that's the news thanks kiano for bringing us into the news all right mike shall we jump into our main topic of episode 162 and talk about wandavision episode eight should we do that is that something that we should do i think it is something that we should do we've enjoyed talking about wandavision over these last last eight night eight nine weeks we're getting ready for the finale right so this is the lead up to the series finale of wandavision um spoilers inbound set. yes yeah, spoilers spoilers will abound the stage is set the pieces are being moved into the final gambit See what I did there? Yeah, you've been watching a lot of uh, Queen's Gambit there. Are you like buying Maybe tickets online? Are you bu- trying to buy tickets right now on your phone? Is that what you're doing? I uh, know I'm playing with my Rubik's Cube. Michael, set the scene for us. Episode 8. Episode 8. So I do have to start because I had a thought. Okay. Because it struck me as something that I didn't that I didn't realize at the beginning. Did every other episode open with the Marvel logo? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um. So previously on, on um, WandaVision, so we find the name of this episode is previously on. Yes. So previously on, previously on. Um, so that's the name of the episode, but, but these are the things that we need to find out, or these are the things that we need to know. Wanda so far has ventured into Agatha's basement, and we learn that Agatha is Agatha Harkness. She's a witch. She's a witch. Burn her. Her. Right. I'm so not a this witch. One, so this one actually goes on a way previous turn, right? So we actually open up on Salem, Massachusetts, in the year 1693. And those of you who are familiar with Salem, Massachusetts, 1693 is right in the middle of their witch trials, right? And it still kind of befuddles me that, that, that we used to, not we, but people used to burn people for being witches. Anyway, so what we see happening now, Agatha is being brought to a platform and bound to a stake. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, so this is going to be her origin story. How does she become a witch? How do we know that she's a witch? Um, she's being she's being led to some type of tribunal. She's confronted by eight other witches, all in a circle, kind of getting ready to judge her. There are nine torches burning, um, but only eight witches. So we think, okay, maybe this is like a breaking away of the group that Agatha is a part of. So maybe she had a place here at one time where she would actually watch other witches being burned. But now she is now she's the one on trial. Um, Ivanora Harkness asks Agatha if she is a witch. Agatha Harkness, are you a witch? So then I thought. I am a witch. She just took a really long time to answer that question. She, That's she all. She did take a long time to answer. So this this definitely, uh, you're thinking now, okay, maybe this is a graduation ceremony. Maybe like she's finished all of her training. She has 
and the question was the question was not so much you know are you a, are you a witch i'm accusing you but are you a witch have you bought into the um the practice are you ready to take on this mantle kind of thing right because that's kind of how kind of how it felt out and then we find out that that's not actually not what happened um yeah, yeah. agatha is being accused of betraying her coven and stealing knowledge above her age and station. Yet you have betrayed your coven. I have not. You stole knowledge above your age and station. You practice the darkest of magic. I know, I know nothing of these crimes. I, I swear it. Enough. So this kind of gave me Doctor Strange vibes, right? When Strange is trying to get into the library um, that Wong is now guarding, and he's like, no, dude, like, you can't, these books, <laughs> you're not ready for these books, right? And so Strange goes in, and he actually does take these, steal the books and stuff. Um, we, we know how it ended up for Doctor Strange, but I wonder, had he been caught? And he even was accused um, by the Ancient One, and more, more, it's not more do, it's, um, it's, um, oh, Steve, help me out, what's his name? Morag, more, I think Morag. it's more do. Is, okay, you you find that out, right? So so we learn that there is a an order and a hierarchy, and and witches don't just get whichever spells they want. They have to learn. They have to pass the test. Um, kind of like maybe maybe degrees um, in karate, where you get your belts and you move up and that kind of stuff. So Agatha is being accused of practicing the darkest of magic. Um, you practice the darkest of magic. That's all. I just recorded is, that because. No, I, 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 we're good. We're good. We got a thing going. Um, so, what is this dark magic? What could this dark magic be? Is she, is she trying to reanimate the dead? Is she trying to make everybody dead? Is she trying to create wealth? Is she, um, is she controlling people's minds? Manipulating what, what the is, stock market. Yeah. What is the dark magic of the time? So I thought, I guess, I guess, go ahead. Sorry. So, you know, cause I was thinking about this, like what would be like something that, Hey, you're not allowed to do this. You betrayed us because previously in the last episode, when Wanda was, did go down into Agnes's basement, we saw the book that was emanating a weird power. And there's a lot of speculation on what that is. We talked about it being the dark hold. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called? So the, the, I believe so. So that thing we talked about it being like, um, from the elder god Cthulhu. It wrote all of his evil works down there, and you know, they had like the spells for lycanthropy, conjuring the dark force, controlling the will of others. And because we saw that down there, I guess I assume that you know maybe Agnes or Agatha had started reading this book and took this book and that's why she's being accused of like this was like a no-no it's like hey don't take the dark hold because this is the darkest of magics and we can't have people reading it because it's going to unleash this elder god that's kind of how i took it i don't know if you were thinking kind of along the same lines so why do you suppose when the first witch got together and she was like i'm gonna make this whole library full of stuff i'm gonna make this book that nobody can read how come the first wish wasn't like I think I'll get rid of this like and save like, a lot of people a lot of problems. Throw it in the ocean over by uh, Megatron? Maybe. Anyway, so so I, I definitely did not read into that. I did not make that connection. The, the thing that I took from the opening scene was that Agatha had a falling out, and, and we're going to see kind of what made her who she is because, because it really turns into like a, uh, a really – weird falling out right yeah. um because they um they accuse her of breaking rules and then agatha says this i did not break your rules they simply bent to my power right so she starts playing the pronoun game which is like which is like enough already quit playing the pronoun game like say what you mean right i didn't break your rules right so did so did the coven say we don't read this book and agatha's like well, the, like doc, being the Doctor book Strange, right? Me. Well, the book is there. 
the book is there. I'm going to read it. I'm a witch. You said I was a witch. You said I could be here. You said I could learn to heal my body. And so now I'm going to read this stuff. And then I'm like, eh. So the witch and starts chanting in Latin and, and they start to kind of like get some blue powers in up in their, up in their um, selves. And they kind of zap Agatha with this, right? And they start chanting something that Steve has, has translated for us. So what they chant is Moors Monstru Natural, right? Which translated could be natural monsters bite or natural death is a monster, right? So then you're like, if, if they're breaking the rules and natural death is a monster, then then like what's going on here? What, what could this be? Could this be a reanimation type thing? Cause if natural death is the monster to unmonster five people, you bring them back from the dead in an unnatural way. Yeah. So, so the, the it, natural death is a, a convoluted. yeah, the natural death is a monster translation came from a website that I was just checking out and it doesn't make much sense to me. <laughs> like usually people are always fighting for natural death and we're always against people that are trying to make themselves immortal. Right. So I, I don't know. I think this could either just be a bad translation or it's just one thing that, hey, this sounded pretty interesting in Latin. So we said it in Latin. So I'm not putting much Maybe. stock into the whole immortality thing. However, as of right now, Agatha is over 320 years old. So, I mean, yeah. there's that. There is, there is that. Plus, she's not a newborn in this scene. So how old has she been alive, really, right? Right. Um, Agatha starts pleading for help and asking the other witches around her to help her because she can't control it. And no, it I cannot control it. I... Oh, it's not I... Not oh, you would me. Right? So, so again, this is a little bit of the pronoun game. So did Agatha then create something that she can't control? She can't control the monster. She can't control the portal to the dimension. Um, and she's wanting people to help her. Or is she just saying, I can't control my power? Um, it, it, it's, again, the pronoun game. And you're, and you're like, you don't know what to think. Steve, do you have a thought on, on ultimately what Wanda's place is kind of in the world? Wanda or Agatha? Agatha, I'm sorry, Agatha. Yeah, so right now it it feels to me like in the first opening scene that she probably found some power that she wasn't supposed to, and it has definitely scared the rest of the coven, made her too powerful, and she doesn't know how to control it, and maybe it's controlling her a little bit. So when Agatha is up getting blasted by the seven different witches with their blue energy hands, um, you can kind of see a orange energy f um, flying around her. I took a couple gifs and like captured capture this just so it's easier to see. But as this energy is flying around her as she's getting blasted, it's very it's like an orange flame looking color, which is also the same energy that is coming off the book that we see from the last episode at the end. So I do think that there is a connection with the book and this untapped power that Agatha has. And that's kind of like where my mind is right now. So and then Agatha, like once they if start you look close on Agatha, you can actually see that not only not only is the is the orange color kind of surrounding her, but it also looks like it's kind of emanating from her also. Yeah. And then as she starts getting blasted by this, she kind of like starts screaming and then finds some sort of control. And then she actually starts um, fighting back against the coven. And she ends up dropping the other seven witches around her and like sucking the life out of them. Um, so do you think the coven is trying to, are they trying to defeat her? Are they trying to, um, like restrain her or like are, exercise are they, her? Maybe are like, so did you get the sense that they were trying to destroy her, uh, that, that they were that threatened by her or they were trying to, um, what happened to, uh, Captain Marvel in, in her movie when she was like, because because she was there was actually a mechanical thing implanted implant implanted implanted in her to kind of um subdue, what's the word i'm looking for subdue her powers um subdue maybe do you think maybe they were trying to do the same kind of thing here maybe are they casting a spell or are these just energy beams meant to meant to do her in um to me it felt like they were trying to do her in like they were scared of what she could potentially do 
So they figured our, our best shot is to get her all at one time um, from all sides. We'll connect her to this, you know, to where we've burned, where witches have been burned, have been burned before. It's tough to say for some reason. So that that's definitely what it felt like to me, especially after um, she drops the other seven witches. Um, Agatha says that she can still be good. Please, I can be good. No, you cannot. So I think Evanor, because we learn like through IMDb that Evanor is actually Agatha's mother. They they say they share the same um, last name anyway, and she's kind of convinced that she can't be turned good. So that they kind of have to like. So Evanor raises up into the ground. She gets this blue crown of energy, very similar to the crown we see that the Scarlet Witch has during the comics. And then she starts to blast Agatha, and Agatha sucks the life out of her. And she falls to the ground and she um, takes that pendant that we've seen her with. The pendant is weird. It's um, three ladies underneath an umbrella. I don't know if there's any significance to that, but it kind of just stood out to me. Um, but yeah, so then Agatha, way back in this time of like, when was it? 1693 is now the only witch in this coven. I'm sure that there's probably other covens in the past. In the comics... Agatha is even older than this. She was like around when Atlantis was around. Um, and there's a bunch of different storylines about her and the coven. And she's part of some pretty powerful covens. And then there's a lot of go back and forth with her, whether she's good or whether she's bad. And I think we're still supposed to believe that Agatha, Agatha is bad in this. But I think as we've seen here in this opening scene, um, see, this is where you go for the deep dives. And we spent all this time just on the first scene here. <laughs> that Agatha was searching for someone to help her, someone to teach her, and maybe they were just too scared of her. And I think maybe this is why Agatha will eventually take Wanda under her wing to help her and to train her is um, where I think this is ultimately going. Um, so that's a good thought from this opening scene. Um, I think I think I don't think so much as you go through the episode and kind of see how it ends up because of some of the choices that both of the characters make and because of, of some of the things that Agatha asks and the path that she takes Wanda on it, it definitely seems like, like they are going to be combatants in the, uh, in the series finale. Um, so, so I, I don't think it's going to be a Wanda Agatha show I think it's going to be a Wanda versus Agatha show. Cool. It'll be interesting to see in two days who is right. So right. Then, then we pull back from this um, trip down memory lane and we go back to the basement where Wanda tries to read Agatha's thoughts. And she's like, you can't read my thoughts. Like, I own this place. You're in my house now. So Agatha makes fun of Wanda's accent, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, that they just keep pulling on that thread. I don't know if it's just like... A bigger joke than so, I thought it was. So, so I think Steve, I don't. You, we are we are huge fans of the Ocean movies, and and one of the things that Don Cheadle gets blasted for in the Ocean's movies is his choice to use an accent that he admittedly and and um, observationally was not good at. Uh huh. Right. He he was not good at it so much to the point where it does become a butt of the joke and a running theme in 13, right? Um, you see his character of Basher car carrying around a book titled How to Speak with Distinction, which is, which is a complete, because I've done research on this, which is a complete nod and Cheadle himself kind of understanding that, that the accent didn't land and now it's becoming a thing kind of in the meta. I, I wonder almost if 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 this is kind of what's happening with Elizabeth Olsen that that the accent because even in even in um, Ultron and Civil War and and all the other movies the accent did come and go it was strong in places and it was very weak in others and I don't know if it was the accent itself because it's a hard accent or if because many of her lines are kind of three words. And I think it's tough to put an accent on three words. Um, 
And, and so maybe, maybe in and of itself, it was hard to do, but, but I think what it is, and I get the feeling that it's just very much, haha, the accent wasn't the best. We're going to keep talking about it so that we can get out in front of it kind of thing instead of people coming back and saying, well, Elizabeth Olsen's portrayal of this character from Sokovia was terrible because she couldn't hold an accent. Yeah. Right. And I, so I guess that that's weird. It, like, it's something that I just like never even like cared about was whether anyone's accent in any of the Marvel movies were accurate or good, I guess. But that was just me. So when well, see, I think, the, I think the reason you think that is because hers, she, she's the only one that has an accent. Um, Paul Bettany has an accent, but, but that's, but that's his voice. Yeah. He doesn't have an accent. That's just him. He would have an accent. Tom Holland if he was speaking American. Tom Holland. I guess that's true. Tom Bened- Holland does speak American. Benedict Cumberbatch. His is kind of rough. At he just times. sounds like the Grinch all the time to me. <laughs> all right. So Wanda tries to magic her way out of that, but she's trapped. So Agatha explains to her, "It's like, hey, didn't you notice? Didn't you notice? Basic protection spell. One at each wall. No. Nothing." These are runes, Wanda. In a given space, only the witch that casts the runes can use her magic. You know, Wanda's like Harry Potter. It just kind of shows up and it's like, hey, you've got this one trick. And everyone else around him is like, like, we live in a magic school. Like, why don't you like learn the spells in these books? Why don't that you, you know bought? more of this? So I got to think and also see just now as we were talking about this. For the longest time, we thought that Wanda and Pietro were mutants right Mm -hmm. and and they didn't go to xavier's school they we thought that they just had these powers and i guess i guess even as a mutant you still need some learning to go on but this definitely goes to show that that everything that she has done up to this point is self-taught just on instinct and just on instinct right and so and so yeah it, it was very interesting to hear agatha talk about this um, cause then you start to think and you're like, yeah, I mean, it does make sense that she ought to have been taught this, right? Right. Because of how powerful she is. So Agatha also yeah. makes the comment that. Why do you not know the fundamentals? So there's a lot of stuff that Wanda just doesn't know. And well, it's... and I think Agatha takes a really interesting point to this and has a really interesting perspective because she understands and sees how powerful Wanda is. And she's. And it, and she's visibly dumbfounded throughout the entire entirety of of the episode. How can Wanda do everything that she's doing and not know what a protection spell is? Right. It's almost like Agatha was like, "Okay, how do I figure this out without tipping her off?" Because she thought Wanda was in full control. She thought Wanda yeah. knew what she was doing, so she. Had to send like, you know, we'll, we'll talk. She talks about um, she finally revealed herself because she was like, OK, I can't do this anymore because she finally realized that she had no idea what she was doing. I got close with fake Pietro, Pietro, if you will, but no dice. And then Wanda's like, that was you? That was you. No, it wasn't literally me. Just my eyes and ears. A Cristalu possession. Necromancy was a non-starter since you're. Real brother's body is on another continent. So the crystalline possession. So crystalline is a protein of the globulin class present in the lens of the eye. So they're going like real deep on like how this stuff is like really affecting things. Um, but the big thing here is when she talks about Fietro and how her brother is actually dead on the other side of the continent. This kind of like destroys all the X-Men talk. In my mind, they're kind of saying like, yeah, that's not possible here. Like, did they bring, you know, Quicksilver from the X-Men universe? Like, that could have just been a coincidence. That could have just been a red herring for us, the fans watching. Like, for her saying this, that the actual, her actual brother is in the ground somewhere still in this universe. Kind of just says like, yeah, guys, we're not getting the X-Men. Like, sorry. Like, I know that we like really were playing you and brought you along and made you think but it i mean it's showing that like you're we're just not getting that right is that the sense that you got that we've kind of just shut that down now yeah that was a very finite 
he's 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 across the ocean. He's dead. I don't know if that I don't know if I read into that that they were closing the door on the X Men. I think they were explaining this situation. Um, and later in the episode, later in the episode, I think it actually. I mean, because it is revealed how they get their powers. Kind so, of. So I don't. Kind of. Kind of. But but it definitely. There are some scenes where where you're like, okay, Wanda may have had powers at one time before we thought she had gotten her powers. So I, I hope it's not closing the door, but but maybe maybe it's only open a. Maybe it's only been left a jar versus kind of just actually open. Yeah, so this whole thing is like confusing Agatha. Wanda. Oh, and I sensed this place. The afterglow of so many spells cast all at once. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. So I know like in the beginning I was like speculating pretty heavily that Wanda just kind of stumbled into this thing that she didn't know what was happening because she even told Vision that back in episode five. The playground stands empty every morning I walk to work. Why? Tell me why. Do you why. really think that I am controlling everything? <laughs> that I, I am somehow in charge of everybody in Westview, walking their dogs, mowing their lawns, getting them to dentist appointments on time. I, I, I don't know how any of this started in the first place. So I think it's starting to kind of reveal when, like, Wanda has no idea what she did. Like, she mm -hmm. she's just as confused as everyone else in this. And we'll get to that as we get to the end of the episode. But then Agatha shows Wanda some pretty impressive hex spells. Um, she uses it that Wanda herself has used on the town. She talks about, and she does with with that large cicada. And I know you'd speculated in the past, Mike, that that cicada might potentially be a person that she just transfigured because she shows off some transmutation. She turns the cicada into a bird. Um, she makes it dance around. So she's doing all these like basic hexes that you learn in Hogwarts like year one, right? So, <laughs> and then Agatha finally asks, you know, what your secret was. And I thought it was interesting that when Agatha said that she was using Fiatro to do this, like she asked the same thing when they're on, during the Halloween special, when Fiatro's like, hey, how you been doing it? Tell me how you've been doing this. Let's see. Did I get a clip for this? Mm, I don't know if I got a clip for this, Mike. Did I? Did I stop? I nope. hope so. No, I must not have. So nope, doesn't look like. But but yeah, he's like, because he asked very nonchalantly, "How how you doing it?" And then once we figure, see, this is this is these are the things that lead me to believe that that Agatha. For for one for some reason, like she really wants to know how Wanda's doing this, and and we and and like why why does she need to know so bad how she's doing this? Right? Search, search for power potentially, maybe. I mean, or unless she like needs this power to undo something in the past. Um, I don't know. So after maybe. this, so so Agatha's like, all right, time to go down memory lane so I can figure out how you did this. Like that's Agatha's main purpose to figure out how Wanda created so much magic and how she's controlling it all. So they go back to Sokovia. Um, Agatha takes a hair off of her head, which I thought was kind of interesting. Do you think they actually pull the hair off of her head? Because it looked pretty fake to me. Do you think that we've gotten to the point in like Hollywood where actors aren't even allowed to like pull a hair off of their head without like having like some I, severe contracts and like what will happen? I'm pretty, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that Elizabeth Olsen's wearing a wig at this point. Fair enough. All right, so Wanda's father turns out not to be Magneto. He's just some guy to me, I guess. And the family <laughs> has... We go way back in time to Sokovia. The kids are young. The family has a movie night, and they love watching old sitcoms and um, that Wanda's been creating in the show, and they can only speak in English because that's their rule of sitcom night. They're going to speak in English. And there happens to be a battle Which happening outside. Which is convenient outside. for those of us watching. <laughs> exactly. I don't like to read subtitles. I watch with subtitles on all the time. Do you watch with subtitles? I, I do have to watch with subtitles. Yep. That's just because I'm I think I, for me it's good. It's because I miss stuff. I think. Plus, I think my I, I think I can't hear very well. What was that? 
Um, so they watch exactly. Wanda's favorite episode of the Dick Van Dyke show. Just something interesting that I saw that I'm going to point out here. So when their dad goes to get those DVDs, he pulls back a, a painting and there's like a hole in the wall. And he grabs the special DVD case from the Dick Van Dyke show out of there. You know what else is back there, Mike? In the hole in the I wall? I didn't notice. There are, several, notice there are several boxes of Nike shoes in the wall. I did notice that, actually. Now that you say that, I so, did notice that. So I'm wondering if this was just like pointing to like maybe um, Pietro at this time is like really into shoes or he's like super fast. So this is a special thing for each of for his kids for each of his kids because we know he becomes yeah, quicksilver and he runs really fast and you can only run really fast in nikes in um Nike shoes. so everything's perfect at this time and then all of a sudden the world explodes the ceiling has fallen down on top of their parents and a bomb comes through the roof Way back in episode two no it was episode one I believe we got a picture of the um toaster and we got a picture of that light blinking on the toaster and the light was blinking red. I went back and listened. The sound that the bomb makes is the exact same sound that we hear that that toaster makes in that first commercial. Ah. So the red light, the ticking of the bomb, that is a memory from Wanda's childhood. And Is I it a Stark toaster? It is a Stark toaster as well. Ah, and get it? Bombs make things go toast? Oh, Oh, I didn't I didn't read into that, but yeah. So there you go. Look Toast. at that. Look at that. All right. So Wanda and Pietro hide under the table and Wanda reaches towards the bomb. Agatha pulls the current Wanda out of the memory and asks her this important question. The playground stands Nope. Up. There it is. Did you stop that bomb? What? You used a probability hex. No, I it just never went off. It was, it was defective. We didn't know that. We were, we were trapped. For how long? Two days. Can you imagine being trapped for two days, like anticipating a bomb going off? Well, but then, but then being a kid and not, and not fully, maybe necessarily knowing what it is. Yeah. Like, what is this thing? Can we move? Can we not move? Is it triggered by us moving? You know? Pretty traumatizing. I think that is a um, a theme of this entire a series. Way, a good way to put it. Is trauma. So what I see yeah. here is a baby witch obsessed with sitcoms and years of therapy ahead of her. Doesn't explain your recent hijinks. All right. So she's a baby witch so she's been a witch at this point from the beginning maybe didn't know exactly what was going on but um after this memory we get another memory of hydra and we know before the age of ultron we know that hydra was hanging out testing a bunch of people they had loki's staff so they were poking people with the staff seeing what it did and there are two Hydra people in this scene. They're listed as Hydra scientists and tech. So I don't think it's anyone that we were supposed to have known or anyone that's going to be important in the future. But Wanda comes in as a volunteer and they tell her, hey, touch the staff. So Wanda goes to touch this before she even moves up to the staff. The stone on the staff breaks away from the staff, floats up to her like some magical little orb that it is, and it reaches out to her. The shell of the gem breaks away, revealing the Mind Stone. And in the super bright light of the Mind Stone, Wanda sees something coming from the stone. And it's a person, and it appears to be reaching out towards her. If you like, pull up the still frame of this, it looks like the silhouette of Wanda in the future. Maybe as the Scarlet Witch, like fully formed, full, all-powerful. It has that iconic headset. Um, headgear that she's worn in the past. Well, and and it, and it does kind of look like her too. And, right? and it, so her, it looks very similar to her. her. Yeah, it could be her past. It could be some foreshadowing. Yeah, and I thought this was interesting because the Mind Stone. I did. I mean, does the Mind Stone tell the future? Can it see the future? Like, how powerful is the Mind Stone? What can it do? Is it showing her that like this is your destiny? tapping into her mind maybe knowing that she is the scarlet witch at this time and just kind of projecting that onto her it could be an image that 
Yeah, I guess it would have to be because because she hasn't seen this image anywhere bef- anywhere else before. Right. Maybe it is kind of like alluding to what is coming. Maybe maybe the ultimate um, power of the Mind Stone is that figure, and so maybe. which which may explain why Vision is so attracted to because he um because he was powered by the mind stone right so or this is why she's attracted to him maybe maybe yeah so then wanda collapses i I did think it was interesting because also in this point i think the the scientists and the tech say that that no one has ever made it past this part right yeah no one's ever survived this and so there's quite a bit of buildup and and even right before the stone kind of kind of breaks through and does its thing I almost got the sense that Wanda and the stone were communing with each other and, and maybe kind of like having a little bit of unspoken dialogue between the two. And that's kind of when we saw it do what it do because the scientists and the tech, their video footage goes from Wanda standing to Wanda collapsed, right? They don't see anything in between and they're befuddled. Yeah. So Wanda collapses. Is that what you said? Till I collapse. That's my uh, till I collapse rap. Till I collapse. <laughs> All right, she collapses, and then the, the scientists are like, "What happened?" So then Agatha was like, "Yo, the Infinity Stone amplified your abilities, or your abilities would have died," which I thought was interesting. So if Wanda never had this interaction, maybe she never would have like developed the powers that she had. So it also makes me wonder, like, did Pietro have super speed before he came in contact with the stone? Like, why were these two the only ones that were able to survive interacting with the stone? Did Wanda maybe have something to do with that as well as the Scarlet Witch? Um, did Pietro even interact with the stone? Yeah, but I, I guess how would he have gotten his powers then if he did not? So well, there's... maybe again, maybe if he would have, if he would have interacted, it, it, it's, it's assumed, we assume in Ultron that they both had, um, were manipulated by the stone and got their powers see from the Wanda's. stone. Right. Yeah. But no, we, we see, see Wanda's um, no, we experience see... with the stone. Um, here we do. Yeah. We don't see, here, Piet... we don't see Pietro's yeah, in so. either, in either movies. No. We're just told that he does. No, we see that he, um, he moves around really fast in age of Ultron. And also but, at the end but of, we see, but we don't see an interaction with the stone. Correct, is what I'm saying. We see we see Wanda's interaction with the stone, not Pietro's. So we we only can assume that Pietro had either he must have had the interaction afterwards, because up until this point, no one had the, survived. The scientist and the tech said no one had survived. So maybe she helped him survive, or did something funky and unlocked something in his mind so that he had powers. We or don't maybe know. He just survived when he interacted with the stone. Right. Same way. Cause if Wanda had baby powers, maybe Pietro had baby powers. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, so after this, sorry, go ahead. No, you go, you go. After, th- after this, we, we cut another scene to Avengers compound. And this is right after age of Ultron. Pietro is freshly gone and and in the ground. Wanda and Vision, this is where we start to first see um, the inklings of their relationship. Wanda and Vision share a moment um, that helps them grow their relationship. Wanda starts teaching Vision about humor and about why things are funny. I think at this point, Wanda is watching Malcolm in the Middle. Um, Vision asks some questions, you know, why is this scene funny? Well, because because he's going through an experience that is never going to hurt him anyway. And we know that's never going to hurt him. Ergo, it makes it funny. Right. And so we start to understand Wanda starts to explain the uh, situation comedies to Vision. Uh, Vision tells Wanda that that thinking about the experience of losing Petro could bring her comfort. And Wanda says that the only thing that could bring her comfort. The uh, only thing that would bring me comfort is seeing him again. And that's sad. It is kind of sad. And, and I think it's a, it's something that a lot of people go through 
um, uh, when you're dealing through going through grief like that. Vision ultimately comforts Wanda, and they sit and they watch the sitcom together. Um, this is Agatha, probably where this is also probably where they start falling in love. Yeah, probably. Um, most likely is what we're led to believe. Um, Agatha digs deeper. Um, yes, Agatha go says this. So to recap, parents dead, brother dead, Vision dead. What happened when he wasn't there to pull you back from the darkness, Wanda? Yeah, so she should really just like give us recaps to every Marvel show. <laughs> no, that that's reserved for uh, that's reserved for Luis from Ant Man. Um, so again, pronoun game. Agatha is actually, I believe, speaking about Vision on this point because Vision is the one that brought her out of that grief. Um, but because Vision is gone, who's gonna bring? Who brought um, Wanda out of the grief of Vision? being gone right. and then we jump to steve's favorite part of this series we go to the sword base I, this actually brought up a lot of questions for me so we go to sword base and now wanda is like into it like before agatha was like all right you go do these memories like this is the first time wanda's like okay here i go i'm charging in here so she goes back to go get um vision back and she's very polite. She goes up to the front desk, asks very politely where the body of Vision is. And they're like, yo, you got to come up here and talk to the director. So she goes and talks to everyone's favorite director, Hayward. I do I do have to say, though, that like, that like this is really, really, really wooden. And like, would this happen? Would, would an Avenger coming in to get just be just be greeted at the front desk? And and uh, someone on the phone going, uh, you have to go see the director. Like like, didn't it seem like out of place for you? Yeah, it's weird because we also don't know like the timeline of Sword, right? We know that um, um, what was her name? Rambo's name, the mom. Monica. No, not oh, Monica. Monica's mom. mom. Mariah. Um, Maria. Mariah. Mom. mom. Yeah. So mom Rambo like helped start sword. We don't know exactly when the official time was. We do know that after the blip though, sword kind of showed up and they started building these super giant logos and putting them in their foyers for some reason. Cause every government agency needs a giant logo to remind them where they work apparently, which is really confusing. Um, so then she goes back and she's like, Hey, go see Hayward. And then Wanda talks about coming back from the blip. When I came back, he was gone. His body. And I know he's here. So she goes back to find him. And then Hayward, like, like, okay, like, how about I show you him first? He's being, like, really weird, like, in the way he's talking to Wanda. And I was, I was talking to Nicole when we were watching this part. And... And from what we learn, we learn that Hayward was trying to bring back Vision from the beginning, right? That was his goal. He's like, my goal is to bring him back. Nothing that I've done has worked so far. And so I got to thinking, well, maybe he's trying to goad Wanda into using her powers to bring him back, right? Which is why he was being so – because because any director of any government agency is not going to let – anybody get near a decommissioned weapon even if you are an avenger right tony stark would have to break in and steal it or change passcodes or iron man his way into it right so like this whole sequence felt very set up in that wanda was being set up by hayward to do almost exactly what she did yeah so way we're so Wanda asks what is this why are you showing me this because you asked to see it. Yeah, so Hayward shows Vision all deconstructed on the table. This is reminiscent of the old comics when Vision is also deconstructed on the table and splayed out. Sounds like they were trying to put him back together. That's about $3 billion worth of vibranium. They're cutting him apart. It's like making her very um, uncomfortable, like it would to see your loved one like taken apart like that. Um, Wanda wants to take vision and bury him and give him a proper death she says that he is his next of kin which i thought was interesting that she got listed as the next of kin but you know 
he's a robot, whatever. It could have been Tony, but I guess Tony's dead now. So maybe Tony passed Vision on to... I wonder if they considered Vision like property when they made him. Well, and and, and we don't know. We, we do learn We do learn that Vision had a living will, right? Yeah. So he would have had to have made that probably probably via um probably circa not via but circa endgame not endgame infinity war because the beginning of infinity war start starts off with wanda and vision alone in scotland right yeah so probably by that time they kind of knew where everything was going and and who knows they they may have been married that's which true would, which would would have made her next of kin yeah. So then Hayward is worried that Wanda has the powers to bring him back online. Not everyone has the kind of power that could bring their soulmate back online. <laughs> see, see, this is the line that made me think that he's like trying to plant this idea, right? Just like like nothing we're doing is working. Wanda, how about how about you just bring him back online and then we'll take him from you? Also like that's the feeling that I got. I, I agree. Also his line delivery. Not everyone has the kind of power that could bring their soulmate back online. Forgive me. Back to life. No, I can't do that. He's all I have. Well, that's just it, Wanda. He isn't yours. Yeah, so I think you are correct that he is purposefully antagonizing her in order to use her powers to bring him back right then and there because there is a... Then, because Wanda's like, oh, yeah, how about I break all your glass? Nine days ago, Maximoff. Oh, nope, this is something else. This is, I'm going to get to this other point. So Wanda breaks the glass, jumps down there, touches Vision, says that she cannot feel Vision. So then she's like, all right, I'm going to peace out. However, at this point, Wanda uses her powers to touch Vision's head to see if she can feel him. So she has interacted with her powers on Vision right now, and it doesn't do anything. So then I'm like, what? Also, Wanda leaves without Vision's body. Now, if we fast, if we rewind back to episode five, because I like going back to episode five, we get this line from Hayward when he's talking to the Wonder, with the Wonder Trio. Nine days ago, Maximoff stormed our facility, stole the Vision's body, and resurrected him. But that's in direct violation of Section 36B of the Sokovia Accords. And the vision's own living will. And it's a lie. So, wh so what's going on, Mike? Like, why is he like lying do you, about do you it? Think it's a, do you think it's a continuity break in the show, or do you think it's purposeful at this point? I think it has to be purposeful at this point because what if Hayward's been replaced and he's a scroll the entire, not the entire time. But after this, he's been turned into a scroll. So he didn't know. He just made up a lie, which is also weird because you would think that it would be common knowledge that Wanda Maximoff came to S.W.O.R.D., wanted to take Vision, and she was talked out of it and left. But he's telling everybody that Vision was stolen and resurrected. And, and if he was, wouldn't there have been a bigger response? Right. So huh. this is like something you know, that's like all, really confusing all, me led to believe the whole time that that this is a reanimated corpse floating around um so right, i don't know we how much led... of it is like for story purpose and how much of it is could actually be an actual continuity break i i think um, it, it has to be story because i i wouldn't imagine that they'd be like oh yeah she stole him no she didn't steal him like that would be pretty egregious to be like oh we messed up on that one sorry there has to be something like deeper here or else, yeah. again, it makes zero sense because she didn't steal Vision's body. But he's like, she stole Vision's body trying to turn everyone against Wanda. But Maybe. For and, and purpose, I don't and know. And for the most part, well, for the most part, it worked. Sword was Sword wanted to blow her up. And it seems like it seems like the only reason the uh, the trio didn't is because they're the trio and we're supposed to think that they're the good guys. Because, because really, what else would they? Because if they were told that that she stole Vision's body, even a bad FBI agent would be like, "All right, we kind of need to take drastic measures." Versus, well, let's really see what's going on here, right? So, 
Yeah, so there's there's still some yeah. shenanigans going on with Hayward. So Wanda leaves Absolutely. Sword Base, finds a folder in her car that leads to Westview. Um, she sees a lot of the cast that we've seen on the show, but in their normal lives. So this is all before the hex. She makes her way home where there's barely a foundation. She opens up the envelope, which is a D to this property. And there's a little message from Vision. And it says to grow old in. So this was kind of a place where Vision and Wanda were going to settle down. Wanda enters the property and she explodes in a blast of red Wanda magic. She constructs her home and the hex, turning everyone into the black and white show. And then from her red energy, yellow energy starts coming out of her and she creates another version of Vision. Or a revision. That's not my joke. I stole that joke. So Wanda at this point probably has no idea what has just happened. Just like we said previously. I don't think she is interested in anything that's happened outside of the hex. I think all she sees right now is a house around her and her husband slash boyfriend that she just brought back from the dead. So I don't think she's even interested in finding out what is going on. So anytime she's like, I don't know what's happening. I think she's actually being honest now that she has no idea like how she's doing this. She just doesn't know how powerful she is. So she doesn't know that she has done it. It's surprising to me that that even though she, I mean, admittedly, she sets this up as a sitcom in a sitcom world. It surprises me that that it's still just a set, right? Wanda wanted to create stability. She wanted her husband. It surprises me that it's portrayed as an actual set because I guess I had it in my mind that that it was just her house. And and the signals that were coming off of the hex were being interpreted, interpreted, interpreted as as a TV show. But we see that it's actually set up as a set. And that's I'm like, what? That, that kind of threw me a little bit and didn't make a whole lot of sense to me when I first saw that. Yeah. So and it's also possible that she's just like going along with it because she has vision They're alone, and that's why anytime someone comes in, like when Monica came in, she's like, hey, stop messing this up for me. I just want to be left alone, but also not knowing that she's 100% responsible for all of it because she wouldn't have known that she was like the nexus of it. Well, and this is the first time we see see it as a set. When Monica has burst through the doors, we've seen her burst through the door. We don't see any inclination – of a movie screen or, or a movie set or anything. So this one threw me and, and hopefully um, it gets tied up for me. Cause I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about it. I don't understand it. Yeah. So then Billy and Tommy, we can hear them after this whole thing. Agatha disappears, snaps her finger pieces out. We find Billy and Tommy being held captive by Agatha in her full witch um, regalia. And she's got, magic lines holding them around their necks and she's like what are you doing and agatha tells wanda that she's supposed to be a myth i know what you are you have no idea how dangerous you are you're supposed to be a myth a being capable of spontaneous creation here you are using it to make breakfast for dinner let go of my children oh yes your children vision this whole little life you've made this is chaos magic wanda and that makes you the scarlet witch whoa mic drop from agatha so chaos magic is the name of magic so powerful that it was thought to be non-existent even the modern sorcerer supreme himself The magic can manipulate, warp, and reconstruct the very fabric of existence and reality to the user's very whims and bring about the total destruction of the cosmos, which sounds really bad when you say it like that. Um, So long ago, and this is where we come back to the Darkhold, long ago the Elder God and Archdemon Cthulhu used chaos magic to rule the Earth as the God of Chaos. However, Earth's mages gathered and ended his reign with a lie. They said there is no god of chaos and there is no chaos magic. I'm sure there's a lot of comics about this that were very interesting to read way back in the 60s. Cthulhu was later sealed within Mount Wondagore. Wondagore, that's also where you get that plant where you can see the future. 
the eventual birthplace of Wanda Maximoff. The newborn Wanda was touched by the hand of the degenerate elder god Cthune, which left her with a fraction of his power and allowed her to control chaos energy and alter reality itself beyond recognition. Without Cthune's intervention, Wanda's mutant powers would have been instead manifested as simple energy manipulation, but instead she became super powerful. Under the tutoring of Agatha Harkness, Wanda later went on to learn to harness the mystic chaos energy as chaos magic, without knowing its true name first, of course, and use it for a variety of effects beyond the simple hexes which she innately performed with it previously. That is all, of course, according to Continuity 616. We are in Continuity 199999. So, <laughs> we have a lot of connections to the Darkhold and to the Elder God Cthune with whatever this book potentially could be, and now talking about Chaos Magic, which has a tie to the Elder God as well. That is where the episode ends. Um, Scarlet Witch is obviously a title for a being, not just some clever nickname that we have made up for someone, which also like makes me think of that line back in episode five when Hayward was like, does she have any nicknames? Like That was just always stood out to me for some reason. But now she does have a nickname. Hopefully she can tell everyone her new cool nickname. And then, Mike, we get to the end credit scene. And this is the second end credit scene that we have had for WandaVision. And we get Hayward, our favorite um, scroll, secret agent, weird being of Cthulhu, Mephisto in some circles of the internet. And the S.W.O.R.D. team is like, hey, we're ready to launch. We took this thing apart and put it back together again a million times. Tried every type of power supply under the sun. When all we needed was a little energy directly from the source. This is the thing that will make me, like, just backflip off the earth. Hayward and, and you know, the S.W.O.R.D. team, they recreated White Vision, all right? So we know that when Vision was created, he was, like, all gray, and he kind of turned himself whatever color. So they have a White Vision. They reconstructed him a million times. They had a lot of time after the blip. They reconstructed him, but also nine days to take that Vision that was on the pet. Oh, Mike. Mike, it just hit me. It just hit me. So Vision that we saw nine days ago when Wanda Maximoff came in and stole Vision, fake Vision, not the real Vision, pulled apart, uh. de- pulled apart, deconstructed. There's no way in nine days they just put Vision back together and turn him white, correct? It could be a decoy. And that's why when Wanda touched him, nothing happened. Because if he says all he needed was a little bit of energy from the source, she zapped whatever was on that table with her energy, and it did nothing. Play the clip again. We took this thing apart and put it back together again a million times. Tried every type of power supply under the sun. When all we needed was a little energy directly from the source. And they Wanda like touched Vision on the head, trying to fill him if he was there, and she got nothing. So it could have been a decoy, or they said they took him apart like a million times. But also, it's only been nine days. I have it's taken me longer to build Lego sets than to put a vibranium creature back together. So, so not only that, in um, in Infinity War, Suri. I think it's Suri. Yep. Um, King T'Challa's sister, who is who is supposedly one of the smartest people on the planet. Um, she it still took her time to do what she needed to do just to excise the stone from Vision's um, from Vision's body. I I don't know if they could have taken the vision apart once let alone a million times but then also if if that was the vision shouldn't there be a big crater in his head from there, where and there was Thanos took the stone from oh him? you mean the new vision the white vision the new vision right so so then maybe is the white vision no no actual relation to actual vision other than it looks like him, um, no. Uh, again, because there's there's a little bit of pronoun game going on. You love there's the also pronoun a little game. bit of I I don't love the pronoun game. There's also a little bit of like don't say it if it's not true. 
We took this apart a million times, put it back together, and all we need is a little bit of power from the source. I don't know. That seems a little wonky. They could just like me. they could just like walk up to the hex and like slap it against the hex if they just need a little right? bit of energy, right? Um, the vision in the comics um, gets deconstructed, rebuilt into White Vision, and no longer has any memory of things previous or like. So it just kind of has no emotion. So that could possibly be what we are going to see out of this new vision and vision and vision are going to fight and we'll have some like revisions, but that's kind of like where it's going. But again, I think things are just kind of like not adding up and things are being glossed over in a weird way. Like if that was the vision, she touched the vision. If you, all you needed was a little bit of energy from the drone. For some reason that drone is like retaining energy that she pulled yeah, on that, which is also yeah, super weird. That doesn't make much sense because, because then, because then, well, I guess they, Monica would would have be imbued with the same kind of power, right? Yeah, it would have been so, her clothes, the jump rope that came back through. So in so in the when when Wanda goes in to get Vision's body and she says she doesn't feel him, maybe that's maybe that's the line telling us this isn't really him. This is something that we made because I doubt they would be using angle grinders on vibranium to try to put it back together. But then, but then if that's the case, if that really wasn't vision, then why did Hayward goad her into trying to use her power to bring him back to life? Was he just trying to drive the point home that there's nothing for you here? Go away, leave us be. So, like you say, I think this episode raised a whole lot more questions than gave us answers. And a lot of things that I think is going to take way more time than a 50-minute series finale to tie up. I agree. I think there's, like, not having the trio in this episode at all now makes it feel like, oh, yeah, you guys are in this show? Like, it seems very, like, we just... Or Vision. We just gave... Or or Petro. Yeah, we just gave Monica powers, and they did nothing with it. Yeah. And we're just kind of like, all right, see you later. Thanks for having powers for seemingly like no reason at all to go into this episode and spend the whole thing like going back into memory lane. Feels really weird. But if we go and see like how long is episode nine, how long is? So what are your like predictions for it then? Like where for the, like, for the for everything, I think I think that. Oh, so Agatha has Wanda's kids, and that's a big thing for Wanda. So if Agatha and Wanda can come to some kind of resolution on the kids, then it'll be a Wanda Agatha battle against Vision, along with with Evil Vision, along with with good vision being mixed in there somehow, the trio, I think, will then end up dealing with Hayward, kind of, you know, enhanced versus enhanced, people versus people. Although Monica's there and she has powers, you'll have to tie up Pietro, whatever he's doing. Which unless, would which would be Monica versus well, Pietro, right? Unless unless Steve Unless, Steve, because Agatha was in control of Fietro from the beginning and Fietro found Monica sneaking, maybe Fie- maybe Monica is captured somewhere in the basement and that's why we didn't see her? Mm, maybe. Because, because, if it was, because if it was Agatha in control of Fietro, then you have to say, well, Agatha was then caught Monica sneaking around. Um, yeah, and then put it, and then put it, and then she would have put a hex on her because at the end of that episode, we see Monica's eyes turning purple. Exactly, exactly. Um, Darcy is still trying to get to Westview, she's not on the outskirts. Yeah, she's not going to play a role at all, I don't think, in the finale. You don't think you, you I don't know what, I don't know what she would do, like what, what would she do in there with vision versus meet up with Jimmy? No, because Jimmy's she's on the outside. Inside the hex. Yeah. Jimmy's on the outside. She's going to be stuck at a stoplight for forever. 
unless unless the hex breaks down as part of as part of the episode then jimmy can come in cuz then you have the whole reconciliation with um with the townspeople regaining their sentience and then the thing that that we haven't touched on since episode 1 who's the missing person yeah it i mean this so this episode running time is 50 minutes we know that 47 minutes of that is going to be end credits so they have a lot to do in a very short amount of time yep. especially to usually when you get like finales like this the last two episodes are kind of like wrapping up things like this didn't wrap up much like I, I'm still not. Wrap up anything. I'm still not convinced that Agatha is the bad guy. I think Agatha like has her own things. Like she does. She definitely doesn't seem like she's the bad guy. It was her all along. Is still just kind of like, well, it wasn't really her all along. It was still Wanda and Agatha. Agatha's just trying to figure out like how to get a piece of that power. I think, and eventually is going to train is that, Wanda. Is that what you think it is? is yeah. It to that end, Agatha wants a bit of the power, or is it gonna tie itself up? to where we see why why Agatha was being put on trial at the very beginning of this episode. I, I think we'll get that, but I also think that, like, you don't set up Wanda as, like, not even knowing what she is without giving her a mentor to figure out what she is. Like, this is, I think this is just kind of going to end up with her going, because she doesn't have anything. Like, we don't even know if her kids are real. Like, it says they might be real, like we know that the vision on the inside is real, but that vision can't survive outside of the hex. So we don't know if her kids can survive outside of the hex. And you think that Agatha is going to be the mentor and not Dr. Strange. I think Dr. Strange and the multiverse of madness is going to tie in, but yeah, I don't, because Dr. Strange, like, no, I don't, I don't think it'd be him. I think the witches will be witches. And then Agatha is going to train wanda to be like the scarlet witch i don't know how well, they'll, they'll strange, tie into strange dr strange wizard, though, he, he's a wizard weird. but he's all like he's right. all british and stuff so then so then so then how come how come strange and wanda didn't have a meeting prior to this because they didn't know about were, dr strange They just like when did Doctor they, when did Doctor Strange become Doctor Strange? Doctor Strange became Doctor Strange and Doctor Strange, but then they he never met up with the Avengers until Infinity War. That was and the first Infinity time War, Thor and Loki found him. He was in New York, because, and the and Wanda was in Scotland. Yeah, so they never gotcha. had a chance to meet. Gotcha. Okay, because they were on a he ended up on a different planet. On a different planet entirely. So it's it's definitely set up to be good. Like like all in all, it's a good series. It's entertaining to watch. It definitely has its cliffhanger moments. It definitely has its WTF moments. Um I think the acting is done really well. Um even the kiddos are doing really well, and that's not usually the case. Kid actors are kinda are kinda rough. I I I still have my issues with some of the characters. Um, I still don't like Darcy very much. Uh, Jimmy, unfortunately, is becoming a throwaway character when I think he could have been really good. Um, Hayward is, again, your your tropey bad director. But who, we don't... Who has don't to be more than gonna, that. I don't think he's going to turn into Skrull. I think... I think more and more. I'm not believing in your two bubble theory. I'm, I'm thinking more and more that he's just a bad director who is craving power at this point, and and wants this weapon. It's weird that Sword all of a sudden is like front and center when we haven't gotten anything from it in any other iteration of any other MCU property that we've had. But we're supposed to believe that. That after Endgame, they're the ones that ended up with Vision, versus versus even just versus the you know Captain America going, hey, we're gonna take this body and bury it for Wanda. I right? mean, yeah, like even more than like Bruce taking the body of Vision because he helped create Vision, and then he just kind of ends up there. Like I agree, it's very yeah. odd that he ends up with Sword, but I don't know. 
I mean, so, so in this world, sword stands for sentient weapon, right? Yeah. Versus, because because didn't you tell me that they made a change from like the comic book acronym to the show acronym? No. To better serve kind of what they were doing. You did tell me that though. I, I'm not sure. Like I I'd never pay attention to the stupid acronyms because they shoehorn them in just to fit whatever word. So like the acronyms mean nothing to me. Like I put no stock um, in the acronyms because. Uh, yeah, it's just like shield. It's like we made these words fit shield, and we made this word fit sword. So, like, well, I I think it's I think it's a uh... okay. So, so the the acronym changed from sentient weapon observation and response department in the comics to sentient world observation and response department. And I think that's enough of a change to like talk about kind of maybe uh, motives. Sentient world. It it changed. Let me let me let me. I think it changed to sentient world from sentient weapon, or it went the other way around, so that they could focus more on, so that they could focus more on the weapons um, vision and not as a weapon. Yeah, I, I can't remember. It must not have been you that I was talking to that about. It must have been someone else. Yeah, but it'll be interesting to see. Um, if you're hearing this on Thursday, you only have to wait 24 hours. Uh, if you're hearing this afterwards or before, hey, thanks for tuning in, checking out the show. Hopefully, you find it enjoyable. We enjoy talking about nerdy stuff because we're a bunch of geeks. So thank you for hanging out with us. We really appreciate all the support. Again. <laughs> You can tune in um, every Wednesday at this time at 8.30 p.m. on Twitch, and that's Mountain Standard Time. Or you can just catch us on any of your podcast catchers, Anchor, iTunes, Google, all that fun stuff. So for me and Mike and for Captain America, I don't think I have a Captain America clip, but this has been the Freelancer Codex, episode 162. Remember to go out there, make the world better than you found it, and we'll talk to you all later. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Freelancer Codex, a podcast brought to you by the Shut Up and Respawn Network. Follow us at Freelancer Codex on Twitter or Twitch. Send emails to freelancercodex at gmail.com or voice messages to anchor.fm slash freelancercodex slash message. We wish to thank all of our Patreons. We are grateful for you all.